Good evening, and welcome to Worcester Cathedral on this second Sunday in Advent, the season when the church looks forward to the coming of Christ, the light of the world. This great building, dedicated to Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary, has a long and distinguished musical history, going back nearly a thousand years. And here, as in many other cathedrals and churches, an Advent carol service starts in darkness at the west end of the nave, and gradually progresses eastwards, out of darkness into light. We begin with an ancient Advent hymn arranged by Sir David Wilcox, who was organist here in the 1950s. Come, thou Redeemer of the earth, and manifest thy virgin birth. Worcester Cathedral was once at the centre of a monastic community. For six centuries, Benedictine monks lived, worked and prayed here, chanting their services several times each day. When the monastery was dissolved in 1541, orders were given that all Latin service books should be destroyed. But somehow one survived, the priceless 13th century Worcester Antiphona, and it contains much of the liturgical music sung here over a period of three centuries. Probably the best known of all these so-called Worcester fragments is the rhythmic setting of Alleluia Salat, which dates from around the year 1290 and was written for a mass of the Blessed Virgin Mary.
Salve Sancte Parens, Hail Holy Mother. This is the most extended piece, and it opens with plain song, which is then sung by the basses and altos at a slower speed, while the other voices weave their melodies above them. Hail Holy Mother. The Advent anthem, Behold the Hour Cometh, was written just over 300 years later by Thomas Tompkins, who became organist here in 1596. He was one of the greatest English church musicians, and this verse anthem, for soloists and small choir, is a setting of words from the Gospels of St John and St Matthew.
Every year, the choir of Worcester Cathedral joins with those of Gloucester and Hereford for the Three Choirs Festival. And for almost three centuries, the festival has brought great musicians to this part of England. One of the earliest who made this journey was the 18th century composer, Dr. William Boyce, whose anthem, Turn Thee Unto Me, O Lord, begins in desolation in a minor key, but ends gloriously with a final section which celebrates trust in God.
Our journey towards the light now brings the choir to face the high altar, gathered around the tomb of King John, as they sing an Advent carol arranged by a contemporary Worcester composer, Roger Hemingway. People look east. At this stage, let's break our Advent journey to talk about those who make the music here in Worcester Cathedral. The secret of the English cathedral tradition rests upon the sound of well-trained boys' voices. Every morning, the choristers and probationers come here to rehearse the music for the day's evensong, and it's here that the real work is done. So let's go into choir practice and see if we can find out why the Worcester choir sings the way it does. Forgive me for interrupting choir practice, but we've all heard the sound of the Worcester Choir, now we're anxious to find out how it's done. So perhaps I can ask you, first of all, a few questions about the history of the choir. Well, there, there's evidence of having been a boys' choir here since about the 13th century, but the actual foundation, as, as we know it today, was begun by Henry VIII, and uh, the foundation consists of 12 choristers. We have more than that, as you can see. Some of them are singing boys and others are probationers, and they're all educated at the King's School, which was founded by Henry VIII at that time. So can you tell me the age range of the boys in this room? Well, I like to, to get them to start at about eight, normally speaking, and they should leave the term in which they attain their 14th birthday. So they come along here and they work as probationers? Yes. And then they come to be choristers? Yes. Now what happens when they come in in the mornings? Do you sort of work on the sound that you want with them? And, and if so, how do you get it? Well, I have to admit, I don't know how I get it, I think, probably, but, but I have to admit that when we come in in the mornings, we've got to sort of get the sleep out of their eyes, first of all. And um, we usually do that by doing the music for the day immediately and seeing if there are any problems and then I can build in any sort of choir training into that really as apply as necessary. Could I ask you perhaps to do a, a small experiment for us to show us the Worcester sound in, in two different ways perhaps could you do a scale whereby they actually change the quality? Yes we will, we will try. Um, let's try a scale to, to uh, A. Coming down from there if you'll start with head voice first of all or so-called head voice and change when I ask for it. We 
certainly hear a difference there. And so you exploit that difference in the way they sing in various sorts of music. Oh, it? certainly, yes. It, the repertoire really demands a certain type of production, in my opinion, anyway. And will they react to the way you conduct them? I mean, like any good orchestra uh, will react to sort of the strength of the beat. Do they react to the way you give them the beat? Well, I think they do, yes. Um, there's could, trouble if they don't. Could I ask <laughs> you to do a small experiment, perhaps go up the scale, perhaps, or something like that, and perhaps they, you could see whether you were react to Dr. Hunt's beat or not, you see. he show right. you what sort of dynamic he's after. Now let's try this one to R. Going up, slowly. Well, you, well, you don't have to rehearse dynamics, do you? Because the conductor actually puts the dynamics into a piece and therefore helps the interpretation of the music mm. get to the listener. Yes. And this is what choir singing is all about to me. That well, I think so, yes. And all about shape as well, isn't it? I think so much yeah. of this comes within the shape that you can give them through your hands and through your face. I Absolutely think. right, because mm. you paint pictures. I mean, mm. isn't, isn't a choir an image of the person in front. It's like looking in a mirror running a choir. It's a terrible thought. Oh, poor lads, yeah. <laughs> and they also sing in different languages, I take it. Do you yes. have a sort of a, a, a run of languages in which you can sing? Yes, well, we, we do a fair amount of French music here, so inevitably that, that appears regularly, and, and German, of course, is fairly commonplace to them. Uh, and we do some things in Italian, and of course the Italianate form of Latin. We've actually got one piece in Portuguese. So you can sing in one, two, three, four, five, nearly six different well, languages. Well, yes, some of those are easier to sing in than English, actually. Um, well, it's, it's a lot of hours every week for them to rehearse. Um, how many, for instance? Well, they come every morning of the week at half past eight uh, until approximately quarter past nine, and then they come again for an hour before the even songs that they're going to sing, which is every day except Thursday. What do the boys make of all this work? Well, I think you should ask one. All right. How long have you been in the choir? Four years. I'm starting my fifth. And why did you come and join a choir like this? Well, uh, something to do is interesting, and going abroad is interesting, and good fun singing over abroad. Now, tell me honestly, do you ever get fed up with all these hours of practice and services? Well, it depends how long they have to be. Sometimes, you know, it's a very long services. You get sort of a bit um, tired. What do you think about while you're singing even song? Um, concentrating really, watching the beat and trying to get the notes right. So all, all real practical things is what you're yes. saying. And what do you want to do when you leave the choir? Well, I'd like to carry on at the school, because it's a, a very friendly school. And um, hopefully if there's a place I might like to become a lay clerk. That's good. Well, they seem to enjoy it. But do you? Yes, very much so. My whole life really has been devoted to, to cathedral music, having been a chorister myself at Gloucester, and I wouldn't swap it for anything. Now we can hear that Worcester sound, influenced by the French tradition, as the choir begin our celebration of light in the Lady Chapel under the great east window of the cathedral. They sing a modern hymn to the Virgin by the French composer Pierre Villette.
From those words written about the Virgin Mary, we now turn to her own song, the Magnificat, which is one of the two canticles set or sung each day at the office of Evensong. This setting was written by the present organist Donald Hunt at the 900th anniversary of Worcester Cathedral in 1984.
The Advent reading is taken from The Rock by T.S. Eliot, and the reader is Canon Geoffrey Fenwick. O light invisible, we praise thee. Too bright for mortal vision, O greater light, we praise thee for the less. The eastern light our spires touch at morning, the light that slants upon our western doors at evening, the twilight over stagnant pools at bat flight, moonlight and starlight, owl and moth light, glowworm glow light on a grass blade. O light invisible, we worship thee. We thank thee for the lights that we have kindled, the light of altar and of sanctuary, small lights of those who meditate at midnight, and lights directed through the colored panes of windows, and light reflected from the polished stone, the gilded carven wood, the colored fresco. Our gaze is submarine, our eyes Look upward and see the light that fractures through unquiet water. We see the light, but see not whence it comes. O light invisible, we glorify thee. O light invisible, we give thee thanks for thy great glory. And now the Nunc Dimittis the thanksgiving of a man who had lived to see the light of Christ. setting was by Hugh Blair, who was organist here at the end of the last century. And so we come to Worcester's most famous musical son, Edward Elgar. It was through the enthusiasm of Hugh Blair that Elgar was asked to write a work for the 1896 Three Choirs Festival. It was his first religious oratorio, and it proved to be a turning point in the composer's life. The last chorus makes a fitting end to our Advent journey from darkness to light. Lux Christi, Christ, the light of the world. 